Good morning, everybody. And Bill, thank you for flying down to be interviewed at S4. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Happy to, happy to be here and was uh, very humbled to be asked. And uh, good to be in front of this group who actually do all the critical stuff, um, even though I do stay awake at night. I'm glad you're all here and working. Yeah, Bill asked me who usually attends, and I told him it's a wide variety of people, but I said it tends to be the people that he would ask what's going on, you know, the, kind of the, the experts that the executives say what's going on. But let's start with something positive. I've heard nothing but good news. I've heard in some of your interviews uh, and from almost every person that there's been great progress in the information sharing of threat intelligence, two-way information sharing between the utilities and the government. I think I wrote it down here, Puesh of, of Caesar called it extreme collaboration. Um, maybe talk a little bit about what's happened and what was the trigger, you know, two years ago that gave it that big jump start. So all the credit for where we sit today was really built on a foundation that uh, Tom Fanning started uh, a number of years ago when he was one of the first ones into the Electric Sector Coordinating Council. Um, he took it to a point, and then uh, when this, uh, the new administration came in, uh, Piyush Kumar, who I think you're going to have tomorrow, uh, was really one of the fundamental drivers to uh, opening up the door to get communication going. And as far as what really prompted it, it was really the concern around events. And uh, of course, we've had a few Colonial Pipeline and others that have happened, but there's also been a number of events that um, occurred which uh, really began to drive the need to uh, open up the communication paths with the intelligence community. And for my perspective, I've been in this business a long time I've never had such an open door opportunity as we do today to go talk to and work with the intelligence community. And that's really fundamental to our success and what we're trying to do. It's been ongoing now for a couple of years at this heightened level and, and the two way, so not just feeding them information, but them sending you information back. Has this information stopped attacks or reduced the impact of anything, like if this didn't exist, would we have seen something bad happen? Well, I don't know if I could prognosticate on what may or may not have happened um, in, in this arena, but at least in our case, for instance, we're hit with about three and a half billion strikes a day mm -hmm. against our networks, of which 10% you know, of that is really legitimate actual traffic. and. Uh, my view of this is that uh, the fact that we have such a strong relationship now with the intelligence community is a strong deterrent to uh, what an adversary may want to do or think about uh, doing uh, from this. And the fact that we're standing shoulder to shoulder with each other um, is, uh, to me, a very strong foundation for the future. Um, mm -hmm versus where we were in the past, which was uh, admittedly quite frustrating, where we were asked to send an inordinate amount of information in, right. and we got zero back. Yeah. And that was extremely frustrating. And so the fact that we're now actually collaborating and getting actionable information coming back to us that we can actually use to increase our defense posture is, is really helpful. I, the audience might be tired, but I'm really hung up on metrics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Apparently. <laughs> uh, how are you gonna measure this? How are you gonna, because you can keep, you could invest more and more money in this, yep. right? You could increase so you could put more sensors in, yep. you could hire more analysts, analysts, and you can spend money in a lot of different places yep. too. So how do you say this program is worth our expenditure today or we should be doubling and tripling down on it? Yeah. Uh, so Jeff Baumgartner, who's the vice president in our organization, who I work most closely with, and he's here, uh, he'll tell you there's, there hasn't been a 
uh, defensive posture software program that I haven't fallen in love with and said, let's go put this one in. And then let's go put this one in. And as we're walking around this morning, it's like, what's that one do? Like, what's that one do? What's that one do? Um, you know, I, this is one of those things where, uh, at least at our companies, there's a fundamental belief that if you can't afford to protect your employees, your customers, and the company and the company's reputation, then you shouldn't be in business. Now, that doesn't mean there's unlimited funding, unlimited resources and such. And I get asked a lot around, how do we look at what's our success factor on all of this? And, and clearly for us, it's that we're continuing to build our defense in depth. We're, be, we're continuing to make sure that if we do have an event, and that's our assumption always, that something is going to get through, uh, can we first strand it in a place that isn't as uh, uh, negatively impactful for us? Uh, and if it is, do we have the capabilities to quickly respond and restore? And that's, again, a fundamental for us. And the way I look at it is, have we had to use any of those strategies? And if not, then we're successful. Mm. Okay. You know, when you were talking about all those programs you were liking, I think you probably, the people out there were saying, oh, maybe I'll go work for Bill. Because that's, that's not a very common thing to hear a CEO say, I fall in love with a lot of technology and I'm always looking to do that. Yeah. Oftentimes it's a little harder sell to get them involved. Uh, we do have a couple of organizations here that are involved with rural, rural electric. Mm -hmm. And you know, you come from Nebraska, you've seen yep. some rural, some farmland in your, and small utilities in yep. your time. How do they play here? How big of an investment do they need to make to, to play in this game to get some of that information and, and be able to use it? So I think that's where the, uh, the ISAC comes into play. Um, I fully understand that not every municipal, not every co-op or even a small investor-owned utility may have the resources to do what others do. And the beauty of the EISAC, frankly, is that everything that we do, everything that we learn, every strategy that we can deploy goes into there and it can get pushed out so that everybody can see it, everybody can understand it. Um, it's, it's a little bit akin to um, back in my, in my nuclear days where I always talked about we're hostages of each other. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that same philosophy is in this world, that we're all in this together and that uh, we have to help each other. In fact, at, at our companies, we have a very aggressive uh, fishing test program mm -hmm. that we do. And when we first started it, it was sort of every person for themselves. If, if someone saw the fishing test come out, they would like silo up, not click on it and, and move on. And we've now, through a lot of communication, a lot of training, we've now turned it into, it's a team sport. So if a fishing test, if a fish test is coming out and you see it, now it's yelling through the hallways, you know, don't click on the free Apple coupon. Um, you know, it's a bad thing. Yeah. Um, and so we've turned it into a team sport, which again is culturally where I want this to head uh, for us. Okay. Let's uh, switch a little bit and talk about recovery. Mm -hmm. How do you think the industry as a whole and Berkshire Hathaway Energy in particular are positioned to recover from a significant cyber caused outage? Yeah. Well, I think. In our case, we, we drill on this constantly. We've, we've put in investments with an assumption that we're going to be hit and that we have to be able to recover quickly. And as we're going through design of new systems, they all have to uh, start with the thought up front that we have to be able to recover from this. So does that mean we're running ghost uh, systems with it and we have to invest in uh, additional uh, components and that's what we're going to do. 
where everybody else sits, I think that, again, it's, it's a little bit varying as you go down through bigger companies to smaller companies. Uh, but I think it's, it's a collective defense uh, such that if most of the grid is protected, then if we do have an event uh, that occurs at a smaller utility, then we can surround that with help and support, which is really where the ESCC comes in, mm -hmm. that we have that mechanism to get coordination between the industry and government to go jump in. Uh, we also have the cyber mutual assistance yeah. program that is now in place, which uh, we developed an, a number of years ago. Uh, we haven't actually had to deploy it, but maybe one or two times. But it has been deployed? It has been deployed. Uh, not in a big way, but right. we have uh, offered assistance uh, to a couple folks. And uh, much like mutual assistance for line workers, right. um, and, and, and admittedly, that, that assistance program isn't, it isn't perfect because everybody's computer programs and systems are different and networks are different. But a lot of times you just need folks who can come in and, and restart computers and get them, get them going. And really anybody can who's in that world can go do that type of work while the, the more technical work is getting done by the folks who know it. And so uh, I think we've done an, a good uh, effort in that regard to put in mutual assistance and um, uh, hopefully we'll never have to use it, but I think we're ready if we do. Yeah, and I think, um, I'm sure Megan Sanford is here and some people from ISA, there's a kind of a parallel exercise, it's called ICS for ICS incident command system for ICS where they're actually trying to credential people to say, oh, this person is capable of doing these sorts of okay. things. Kind of, kind of like they've done it with the linemen where you have different yep. credentials. Okay. It's, it's still very early, but I think, you know, there's, and I believe there's some crosstalk between those two. Okay, excellent. The, the other area that I've heard you talk about and is really in the news lately is transformers and yes. other physical equipment and sparing programs because, I mean, it's still, it's one of those things where we're seeing more actual incidents from physical, right. right? So far, we haven't, at least it hasn't been public knowledge of transformers exploding because of cyber right. attacks. Um, you know, maybe coming someday. Mm -hmm. I have seen a transformer explode, I think, in New Jersey because someone made a database error. Oh. But it wasn't malicious. It was okay. just, yeah, uh, just a, a different kind of cyber yep. incident. Accident. Yep. But how do you see these? Uh, you, I've heard them called spare transformer program, strategic transformer reserve. Do you think that's important? And if if so, or if not, that's fine. But if so, how would you see that best implemented? So I think it's critically important. We're a founding member of a couple of those programs where we're sparing transformers and and working with government to. Uh, ensure that we have access to the transformers that, that we need. Uh, I would say that we were pretty disappointed when the uh, IIJA came out and there was not money in there for support of uh, domestic transformer development and manufacturing, um, even though uh, DOE recognizes that it's, it's a clear issue for us. Mm -hmm. um, that we have to figure out how to get that manufacturing into the, into the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, do we have enough transformers out there? Absolutely not. Um, especially uh, these days. Especially right? these days. Yeah. And, and I would say that uh, sometimes you're better lucky than good, but the fact that we had a relatively light hurricane season, storm season, uh, was very helpful because we didn't burn through the inventory that we do have. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that's an area where there's good mutual assistance if people need components, there's good sharing, but uh, in these times, it's a little more stressful to give up transformers because mm -hmm. now you don't know when you're going to get them back. Mm -hmm. And so it is, it's a stress point. Uh, I think that uh, the leadership at DOE fully understand it's a stress point and we're working on some solutions with them and through the ESCC, but that's all going to take time to get manufacturing stood up in this country and, and help uh, give them volume uh, so that they have the confidence to start uh, building transformers here at a, at a rate that we need. Well, and, and you could have, I mean, this is, we're more of an ICS crowd than an engineering crowd. You could have some 
relays and other things that could be, you know, you could have all your relays bricked or something like yeah. that. And so there's a, a, this whole concept of having enough spares to deal with this. Who pays for that or who do you think should pay for that increased level of sparing if that's something we should be doing? So it's going to, it's ultimately going to be the customers. And um, for the, for the regulated utilities, um, we've been talking with NARUC, which is the, the group of all the regulators um, in the country, where um, over, the, over the years it's always been lowest cost option. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now what we're talking with them about is lowest risk option, which may actually cost more. Mm -hmm. And uh, doing an assessment around components that uh, are significantly lower risk, which may cost more, but that's what we're going to be pushing forward for approval. Um, and uh, I was at a neighbor conference uh, a few months ago with Chris Inglis, actually, from uh, the National Cyber uh, Office, and that's what we were actually talking to the regulators about, is we have to change the mindset that it's no longer gonna be the lowest cost because generally that could relate to being the highest risk. That's a state by state or jurisdiction by jurisdiction battle, right? It is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that, that might be an area where DOE or someone else was showing some leadership saying it is okay to do this or it is, it is encouraged. Yep. And, and one of the things that we have been talking to DOE about is, is that manufacturing cost gap so that uh, perhaps there can be government funding to step into that gap from where we're buying components today to U.S. manufacturing to allow that manufacturing to get their feet under them and get moving and bring their costs down over time uh, with the government buying down that gap, so to speak. And uh, we'll see where all that heads. Um, th it certainly is not an issue with companies wanting to order components. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's plenty of, of demand. Okay. It's really getting that into the hands of the manufacturers and being willing to sign up for five years worth of transformers, yeah. which we would certainly, at our companies, we would certainly be ready to do that. Okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about your company before we move to economics. You said something I found fascinating when you, Kim Zetter interviewed you a little bit ago, and, and you said you, uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy takes recovery planning using a drilling down approach, taking automation technology the next tool away and being able to deliver your power. So you, you're constantly saying, well, what if we didn't have this? What if right. we didn't have this? How does that report up or how do you, again, how do you measure that? How does, you're in the executive office, someone says we're doing this. How do you track that and decide whether enough is being done or you need to do more on that? Well, again, I can't speak for other companies, but in my case, I'm actually personally in, uh, in the control room area that we're running these drills and talking with the teams and challenging them on the lack of technology as we're going through these uh, drills and mm -hmm. these assessments. And we're very focused on uh, OT on these. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of like, I don't care if we lose email, that's, you know, it's really OT focused. And as we go through this, uh, and we start stripping away technology, and we get down to a point where I sort of laugh, it's we're left with ham radio operators and cockroaches, you know, yeah. um, um, that are left standing yeah. on this thing. And, uh, and then we essentially look at what the gaps are through that and then decide, is there an alternate technology that we can deploy? Is there uh, some sort of, um, uh, communication process that we can put in place, mm -hmm. you know, sort of go back, find find the retirees from 30 years ago who ran the system on mm -hmm. index cards. You know, can we do that? Um, we do have a inventory across our company on ham radio operators, and we've set up ham radio base because uh, they'll be able to communicate till the very end. Uh, and so it's it's really peeling back every tool that our teams think they have 
until they have nothing. Mm. And then rebuilding it back up to, okay. to say, okay, we need to fill this gap. We have to figure out how we're going to go do that. Mm. Yeah, some, having access to some of those retirees is important. I know, I don't know, but I was told that Colonial Pipeline actually had to call in some of the old timers oh. to, to restart their pipeline. Start, that, yeah, you know, yeah. Just because well, that had never been experienced and, before, and, yep. and they did that. Okay, let's switch to economics. Yep. Uh, you said something, and I'll bring this back to security, but you said something at the TCU Global Energy event that just blew me away. You said, if climate change is important to our customer, then it becomes important to us. I don't wake up every morning, morning personally worrying about climate change. I wake up wondering who's in my OT networks. That's right. So in that sense, I, I, I get the sense that you're going to invest in climate change if your customers think it's important, but Berkshire Hathaway Energy has invested tremendously in renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So why would you, are your customers asking you to make that investment or why would you make that large investment after saying something like that? Yeah, well, it's really, it's, it's a risk-based issue. For me, um, having OT networks that are running not only in this country but in Canada and the UK and know that if we have issues with that, then there's immediate impacts to customers, there's immediate impacts to our reputation. I sort of put that in a different column than I put climate change. I don't wake up every morning um, uh, deathly afraid of, of climate change because we're making the investments and we've made the commitment to transition away by 2050. And, those plans are in place and the money is there and we have the resources to do it. Uh, our customers are asking for it. Um, yeah. uh, a number of our customers are uh, tech companies and others who want to have 24 seven renewables. And, um, and obviously in Iowa, for instance, uh, Senator Grassley was the, was the uh, father of the production tax credit. Mm. And so Iowa is uh, I would say the the poster child for renewables for our company. We're going to be uh, essentially 100 over 100 percent renewable in a couple of years if you take how much energy our customers use and um, and factor that into how much we generate, right. not minute to minute, but on an annual basis. Uh, so I sort of set that. That's over here. We've got the plans going forward. We're we're doing it. OT networks is to me, it's millisecond by millisecond by millisecond, like yeah. what is happening and what are we doing to prepare ourselves uh, for that event that will eventually occur and are we ready? Yeah. And, and related to that, this is how it kind of comes back. You, you were talking in this case about climate change, but I think the same idea might apply to security. You said, you said, how does this reasonably economic not hit the customer in terms of increased energy costs? And how does that apply to cybersecurity? So are we at a point where we're gonna have to ask customers, you, you kind of touched on this earlier, but we're gonna have to say, look, rates are going up because we need to have a more reliable, secure grid. Are you expecting that? I am. I, th I think that um, as we onshore transformers as we continue to uh, really have to invest in technologies um, to thwart the, the various adversaries that we have. Um, some of that can be absorbed within uh, our operations, uh, but ultimately uh, to do it at a level that I think is going to be expected, uh, particularly coming out of the national cyber strategy, uh, those are gonna be costs that are going to be above and beyond what most companies are gonna be able to absorb. And so uh, I think there will be increased costs because of security, um, but it's a cost of doing business. Again, I think it's one of these things where uh, if, you can't, if you can't afford to do this and do it right and keep your costs reasonable for your customers, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Hmm. Related to that, FERC has been putting out some RFIs in that about carrots. About, about what, I'm sorry? Carrots, instead of using carrots. sticks oh, and saying Nurek SIP, they've been saying, can we provide incentives 
two utilities to spend money on this, and they've been asking for suggestions, and they've put out saying, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Do you like the approach, or do you think, I guess like isn't as important as, do you think it will be effective if the government offers that, or is it worth at least experimenting with? You know, I think, again, anything that the government can provide, if it's provided in the spirit of, of moving the industry forward um, and keeping what we need to do aspirational and keep, and keep pushing for something that is futuristic, uh, to me, is where we need to go. Um, most regulation, if not all regulation, is generally backward looking. And by the time it gets put in place, it's too late. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we've been advocating is uh, really aspirational uh, incentives, aspirational regulation, if you will, uh, that continues to push the industry to go further faster. Mm -hmm. Because you can't, you can't regulate what we're, what we're up against. Um, and, and, and not just in the energy sector, I, I would say that's across all sectors that have critical, uh, critical uh, control systems. You know, I really appreciate, I'm, I'm sure the audience says how you've kind of stepped up to this. Tom Fanning, it used to be any time we heard about a, a large government or industry effort, you'd see Tom's name there. Yep. And now Tom is, he's still involved, but oh, yeah. stepping back a little bit, and now you're kind of stepping into some of the things he's done. I'm wondering, is this by design that we tend to see one person from the industry, or should we be seeing, you know, 10 people, 10 people in your role, maybe not all CEOs, but high-level executives in, in the industry being out there, being the faces, or do you think it's more effective to have kind of an industry go-to like we've had the last few years? I, I think at this stage, uh, it is more helpful to have a point of contact. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm not by myself, um, I do have uh, comparable co-chairs uh, um, in the public power world and the co-op world, Dwayne Hiley from Tri-State and uh, 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 Kevin Wells from uh, Lincoln Electric System sort of covers the, the, those sides of the industry and we work very collaboratively together. We talk a lot um, around these issues. Uh, but I think you still need someone who's going to continue to put the foot on the accelerator and, and, and keep pushing to get this done. The, the speed of industry and the speed of government are not the same. Mm -hmm. But we need to get them closer. Okay. And I will, the perfect example of this is the ETAC, the, the Energy Threat Analysis Center that DOE is trying to set up. Okay. We have to get that moving and moving faster together. Mm. Um, because that's where, for the, uh, the electric industry, we're going to be standing shoulder to shoulder with the intelligence community and that criticality of sharing. We're on the front lines. We're gathering all the data. We don't know what to do with it. Mm. We can hand it off right to the intelligence community. They know what to do with it. They can give us immediate feedback. And then we have this sharing and, and a much faster transfer of information so that we can actually put uh, actionable, uh, actionable uh, items into, into practice. Okay. Well, that's good. I really appreciate you coming down. Um, yeah. I, let me give you the last word here. Is yeah. there anything you'd like to say to this audience to ask for help, to encourage them, to tell them to do a better job? I don't know. Oh, anything you want to tell no. these people? Well, I'm, uh, I'm hum humbled to be here, humbled to be in front of this group. And uh, like I said, I, I feel as though in the role that I have, I try to find resources, I try to break down barriers, and try to find help uh, to work collaboratively together. Uh, and that's my commitment to all of you is what I'm going to continue to do uh, and hopefully that aids in uh, what all of you do to continue to help keep us safe um, as we go forward. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. You bet. Thank you.